Well, I'm joined now by our international affairs commentator, Douglas Herbert. Doug, thanks for being here. Uh, why is Shishov's death being treated as a possible murder investigation? Because the authorities there are wary because they're looking at a broader, very troubling pattern, uh, not just involving this latest death, but they're looking at, uh, within Belarus, uh, the strongman leader, Alexander Lukashenko, has basically crushed in the past several months all opposition, whether we're talking about opposition figures, whether we're talking about human rights activists, whether we're talking about journalists who dare to be a little independent or investigate, do their jobs, in other words, uh, cracking down, arresting uh, thousands of opposition figures, uh, some of them accusing, saying that they were tortured in jail, uh, and uh, a lot of them have fled. And this crackdown has, in recent months, we see more and more signs that Lukashenko is not just cracking down domestically at home, but he is doing it abroad. That is, he is going after Belarusians, such as Shishov, who have gone into exile, and in his case, in exile, helping others like him, his compatriots, to basically find accommodation, lodging, and basically set up a new life because they fear for their safety if they stayed in Belarus. So it's a pattern. But more specifically, with this particular investigation, you're right to underline, they're not investigating it as a murder yet. They are trying to determine. They're looking at both possibilities, murder or suicide. But they do have signs, worrying signs, including the fact that uh, supporters, friends in Belarus, had warned uh, Vitaly Shishov of potential threats to his life recently. And a human rights org, Vyazna, on Telegram, uh, basically tweeted uh, that friends, cited friends of Shishov, has saying that strangers had been following him during his recent jogs. This would fit a pattern also of Belarus dispatching, say, security agents, the Belarus version of the KGB, to follow, to track dissidents, exiles abroad. There are also headlines about a Belarusian athlete at the Olympic Games, uh, one activist group calling on the International Olympic Committee to suspend Belarus from the Games. Absolutely. We know the story with Kristina Tsimonovskaya. She was an Olympic sprinter, and she basically says she was uh, being forcibly returned to her country after what did she do? After basically criticizing her country's Olympic Federation on social media, criticizing uh, them because she claims that they forced her. They were forcing her basically to participate in an event that she never trained for. It was not her event at all. Um, and using this as a pretext to repatriate her, she sought protection at Tokyo's airport. And in, in the past 24 hours, she has actually received a humanitarian visa offer from Poland, and she's set to leave there Wednesday. A sports activist organization, it's called Global Athlete, is basically calling for Belarus to be suspended by the International Olympic Committee, uh, citing yet another example of abuse of athletes and a flouting of any concern by the IOC for the athletes' uh, health and safety. And this is a prime example of that. Uh, they say that over the past year, Belarusian athletes have been jailed, they've been removed from jobs and fired, they've been intimidated, harassed, uh, and they say that uh, this is a prime example of that pattern continuing. They say Belarus has no place at these games. Suspend Belarus now. So these two events taking place in Tokyo and Kiev, but within Belarus itself, the crackdown on dissent continues. Uh, Why hasn't the international outcry affected Lukashenko's actions? Because Lukashenko knows he can get away with it. He says he has absolutely nothing to fear. And why does he have nothing to fear? Look, obviously, boiling it down, perhaps overly simplistic, but essentially he has Russia's backing. He has Vladimir Putin's backing. Does that mean Vladimir Putin absolutely loves Lukashenko and everything he's doing? No. And we saw signs last year during the bloody crackdown uh, in the wake of the disputed elections when the street protests erupted in Minsk. We saw that Putin was not all too pleased with it. But they do share one thing. They share an outrage at what they see as a perceived uh, uh, victimization of Russia by the West, the West trying to humiliate both countries. And also, uh, Putin fears that the West is trying to basically use uh, Belarus as a sort of uh, staging ground uh, to whip up protests and then to sort of bring them over to Russia. So they're very much tied together in their world outlook, the way they see things. They met together on Putin's yacht back in late May after uh, the, you know, a week after this uh, pr this plane was forced down, this commercial airliner carrying a dissident who was then arrested in Belarusian territory. So Putin, Lukashenko, they're not great friends, but they do have an ideological sort of kinship. And that is a lot of what is keeping Lukashenko in power. He has no fear. All right, Doug Herbert.